Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, uh, we are here uh, starting our uh, neurovascular webinar. And uh, we're fortunate to have a, a distinguished guest today. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Gustavo del Toro. He's the, the executive vice president and chief medical officer at Wyckoff Medical Center. Uh, uh, before becoming a hospital administrator, he was, uh, oh, he spent some time in the pediatric uh, department at Miami Children's and then uh, spent time at Memorial Sloan Catering uh, in the oncology department before uh, heading the bone marrow transplant unit at Mount Sinai Medical Center until he joined uh, uh, Wyckoff. Uh, how long ago was, uh, did you move? Eight years ago. Eight years ago. Wow. Yes. It's been a while. Yes. And uh, I see Dr. Langer joined us as well. So welcome. And oh, um, we, can, we cannot hear you. David. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like your jacket. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Gustavo, um, obviously the one of the main uh, uh, reasons uh, for our conversation today is because you being a, a, a administrative and clinical leader at one of the major institutions in New York City, uh, you have been directly impacted with the pandemic. Uh, what has been the experience like? Well, uh, it's, it's been the biggest challenge of my career. And uh, it's been a tremendous learning experience. One thing that that uh, people keep saying is that New York City out, uh, evaded hospitals from becoming overwhelmed. But I tell you, we were overwhelmed. And we were overwhelmed for quite a bit of time. Uh, we were under and we were taking in more patients that we could handle. We had enough equipment and we had enough uh, machinery to treat them but we were totally overwhelmed uh, during most of the peak five weeks between late March and uh, mid to late April. So, and how, were you, how were you able to adjust uh, manpower to be able to take care of all those patients? Well, first of all, uh, nursing was a big, big need we redeployed our ambulatory service nurses into the inpatient areas and the critical care areas. And we had to bring in nurses from outside. And NAPA, who's, who provides anesthesia services for us, uh, the CRNAs, the certified registered nurse anesthetists, uh, many of them, came in and worked as frontline critical care nurses for us to help us out. In terms of nursing, we, we deployed, we got, we took from outside and NAPA supported us. In terms of physicians, we had to go to locum tenants for critical care physicians because we only have two in the house. And after a while that was not enough. And I, I heard that Dr. Langer my, my, could have helped us uh, in critical care. Langer, thank you. Next time we'll call you. And um, uh, we also brought in about nine licensed uh, people with li limited license permit as house officers just to help us uh, in the front lines. Our emergency department uh, physicians uh, held their own. The, the nursing staff needed a lot of support. Um, and uh, we redeployed a lot of people. We created teams uh, of people that were redeployed uh, to, to do things they had never done before. For example, a, a team of dentists, of the, a dental residents became the liaison between patients and their families. So they, and they're still doing that today. They go around the hospital and they call every patient, a relative, they call them and they ask him if they want to talk to their, to their relative and they try to communicate or, or carry messages through. Th those are dentists. We had podiatrists who sat 
Uh, at Lenox Hill, we had neurosurgeons doing that function. That's beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> so so we, we redeployed and we, um, no job was too, too low or too high. And um, that's how we got through this. And, and, and now the question is, uh, uh, actually going back to that moment, I know that it, you even got sick during that period of time. Yes, I got infected with COVID and so did my wife. It was not pretty. It was, uh, I had to come out of work for nine days. The first six days I couldn't even work. I felt so sick. Then the next two to three days I worked remotely. And then finally my boss got sick, so I had to come back. And I did, and I've been back since. And my wife was sick for quite a long time. And uh, uh, thankfully, we did not have to go to a hospital to seek care. So you and your wife are back to normal. You're fine now. You recovered. Yes. Great. Great. And your boss? He, he recovered very quickly, actually. Yes. Okay. He's back. He's good. good. So, so now the, the, the real conversation now, uh, and this is for everybody to chime in, is how, how are we going to evolve? How are we going to go to a new world in which uh, uh, the healthcare providers feel uh, secure going to the hospital and not feeling that they're going to be exposed to getting sick, number one. Uh, number two, how are patients and their family members going to feel comfortable that we are evolved and that uh, from now on, it is important that people come to the hospitals. As you know, there have been, uh, uh, yesterday there was a publication that there were uh, excess of thousands of patients per month uh, that died in New York City uh, for unexplained reasons, not COVID related. So, so we know that there were people uh, dying at home from heart attacks, people dying at home from uh, strokes, uh, and which is what we deal with on a daily basis, uh, how are we going to evolve? How, how can we transmit this to the confidence to the people so that they come to the hospitals? I think some of that work is up to us as leaders of the individual institutions. Some of that work is going to be the media and the government because as long as the governor says it's not safe to go out it really limits uh, our, uh, our ability to bring patients back even if we have created a safe environment and we have to create those safe environments and and it's not simple um, we have to uh, uh, have COVID front and center um, with every single patient, we have, for example, for patients who are surgical candidates, we are having them tested, we're planning to have them tested several days before the procedure. But if it's an emergency, we are doing rapid testing so that we know and the patient knows within an hour whether they are infected or not with COVID, because as you know, there are many people walking around with COVID that don't exhibit any symptoms or maybe mild symptoms. So COVID, COVID um, status, so to speak, is an essential part of the comeback. The, the, what the newspapers, the internet, the, uh, all the social media say about the safety of our institutions and, and the city um, and transportation, right? All of those factors. And then what the governor says, and uh, he, he, he's, he's very influential. He's, he, he's very powerful and has done a great job. And he's listened to and respected. Uh, and, and his word carries a lot of weight. And uh, so far we're seeing an incredible amount of reluctance to come back. Um, and uh, even those, even though we cannot start elective procedures, uh, as as no one can in New York, 
when we reach out to the patients that we know need these procedures, they don't even want to uh, uh, talk about it. So, so we have to show them that we have uh, we have the ability to keep them safe when they come in, and that includes testing for the virus. That includes um, a segregation. Uh, it's not a nice word, but segregating the uh, patients who may be infected or are infected from those who are not. Uh, it, it, it includes spacing out in terms of the, the distance and also spacing out in terms of time. Uh, you can do a much better work job of separating patients that are waiting to be seen if you extend your hours and you give more options for patients to come in. Uh, 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 we have to show that, uh, you know, if, if they come in and what they see is people walking around in spacesuits and uh, uh, they, they get very concerned. We have to wear appropriate personal protective equipment and so do the patients uh, when they come in and we are limiting the number of guests and visitors and companions and that's also very painful to, to patients and their relatives and that's a big factor keeping them from coming in. So it, it, it's a big task. Um, it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of time and we are to, to a substantial extent uh, depending on the perception and the perception is going to be some of it is our work and your work some of it is uh, what we call media and some of it is the the government so right now basically we're waiting for the government to give us a green light uh, we are waiting we are preparing i'm sure you are too we are preparing and getting everything in order for that day um, so that we can start you know of running when that happens. But right now, in terms of doing anything other than emergent procedures and maybe urgent uh, at a place like Wyckoff where we only have one OR and you know, we don't have a, a separate place that we can dedicate to procedures, uh, we're really, uh, we're held hostage to, to the law. Okay. Right now. Uh, Dr. Cerulli, obviously this is a, a, a little bit different when we're dealing with vascular, cerebrovascular pathologies because they can be considered, some of them are emergencies, some of them are urgencies. So, so how do you view these specifically at Phelps Hospital where you are right now? I think there's no question that, um, first of all, um, during the whole pandemic, the last two months, we have seen a big decrease of um, stroke and acute vascular pathology evaluations. And in fact, uh, a very good paper just came out this week in New England, Journal of Medicine, looking at the neuroimaging evaluations of all the stroke patients across the country. And that was done using the RAPID software that a lot of our institutions use to evaluate for acute stroke. And they saw the decrease was more than 50% at some point. So that kind of like mimics what has happened elsewhere. Other than that, um, our COVID census is less than 20% what it was at some point in the peak. And we are slowly starting to do now the, the semi-urgent procedures um, that we had to cancel at some point because of the epidemic. And now we are um, slowly starting to do them. So I think we're on the right track in that sense. And hopefully that trend will remain like that going forward. And, and David, you're very involved at Lenox Hill with the process or the recovery process. Uh, where are we right now at Lenox? I cannot hear you. I wanna ask one question of, uh of uh, Gustavo before I says anything. First of all, how does, this, how does this change you? I know this experience has changed me uh, a lot. And I, 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 I could be could go on for, for hours on how it's changed me up here. So I'm wondering, you have, it's your, it's your 
turn today. So you can talk about how it's changed you. That's number one. Number two, I want wondering if you could comment, there's a lot of data on zip codes and the worst outcome based on your zip code. And, you know, population density, if you look at population density and uh, COVID risk, it's, it's dramatic. I mean, if you go from a thousand people per a square mile, which is like, you know, very light, when it goes to a thousand, two thousand per square mile, it doubles. When it goes to two to three thousand per square mile, it doubles. New York City is around 10,000 people per square mile. It's logarithmic. So there's, there's a population density issue in New York for sure. But when they looked at the zip codes of the different parts of New York and where people basically got sick from, based on your zip code, the, the patients with from poor economic backgrounds, obviously, and this has been a, you know, a, a real problem, based on zip code, we saw a worse outcome with, with, with COVID. If you were coming from a, a, you know, a lot of people say it's public transportation, because basically population density is about the same. I mean, if I live in an apartment building, you know, I ride an elevator when I come home. Uh, you know, our families are close. What do you, th do you think there's more to this? And I don't, I think access to care wasn't the problem because your hospital got overwhelmed and they all came, you know, whether you could provide, you, you sound like you got, you got a lot accomplished. What's your thought, number one, how this has changed you as a physician, because it's changed me. And why do you think that the population density is only part of the reason for this kind of massive problem in the, in the underserved? And uh, how do you think this is going to manifest in these underserved hospitals going forward? Because this is a problem Northwell's having, by the way. You know, we have to be, we're, we're governors who relied on Northwell to help with the solution. So. I think, David, that he, uh, referring to your first question, um, I, it's changed me and it's changed me in a couple of ways in the professional I'm not afraid of anything anymore and uh, I've seen that happen to me in other stages of my career before something really intense that has kind of galvanized my attitude towards the work and as a physician leader at a community hospital, this did it for sure. I had no fear, no fear whatsoever. And uh, I'm, 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 I wouldn't have said that unless you had asked, but that's a, that's a reality. As a person, um, I think the, the, the part that really, there's two things. One of them was the, the, the personal event of being infected and not knowing where you know, in the, in the first few days, you don't know how it's going to play out. And then basically bringing it to my wife and having her get infected simultaneously was quite um, scary. And uh, it's changed my outlook in terms of, of priorities. And uh, it, it's made me value our, our relationship, our marriage even more. So it's been very deeply, it has a deep impact in, on me, both on the professional level and the personal level. So that's my answer to that. In terms of the second question, um, the, the, I have not seen the, the zip code data that you're mentioning, but I understand it from what you say. I think that in terms of the uh, underserved, uh, one, of the, one of the problems that the underserved face in, in our nation is uh, comorbidities. And uh, a clinical conditions that, or quasi-clinical, right? Uh, conditions that will uh, facilitate the damage done by this still not completely understood phenomenon. And, and of course, we all know about the, the typical ones such as, you know, obesity, which has been a huge contributor and diabetes and high blood pressure and cardiac disease and so on and so forth. I think that's a big reason why this has affected our communities at, at Wyckoff and in Queens and in Brooklyn and in some parts of Manhattan so much. Another one is when you know, 
uh, when people have to get in on a subway and the subway is running less frequently and when you get into your subway car it's like peak time uh, at Times Square on a work day but it's 9 p.m. and you're going home but there's only one train every 45 minutes and it's in the midst of the crisis and you're having to deal with that that you're being exposed in ways that should not have happened. So I think that in terms of the underserved, the comorbidities and also the, 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 the need to be exposed to things like uh, diminish public services, right? And that the need to be out there working for people who do food deliveries and people who, uh, policemen and, and, uh, and the people in the MTA that have died so much and needless to say, all our frontline people in healthcare. So the exposure by work, the exposure by need, and the comorbidities would be the three things that I would uh, attribute to that. We're gonna hear you, David. So we're going to the next step. With the, with, the, with, the, with the policy of testing and with the op, you know, opening up and, and letting people, how do we, I mean, I don't see, I, I just, it's these same social determinants are not going to change the next six to 12 months, if, if, if any time in the near future. Um, and um, how do we, I mean, and Wyckoff is, is in the crosshairs of this again. Um, and it's a financial issue, it's a, it's a healthcare issue, it's an ethical issue, it's a social issue. And in Northwell, you know, we have to, one of the things, well, my, my sort of epiphany moment actually was we were, it was around, it was when the thing was just blowing up in early April and we were running out of ventilators and I was working in the unit. We were communicating with families. That's one of our jobs here, we were doing. And uh, my wife, who's an anesthesiologist said to me, he says, you know, the, the plastic surgeons have ventilators in their offices. It's like, that's a great idea. So I'm like, get, and this is how crazy this was. And the whole procurement issue was a mess. So I called up the chair of plastic surgery and I said, Charlie, hey, you guys have ventilators, right? He goes, yeah, they had 40 ventilators in the Upper East Side. He had 40, I mean, it's like this the ground zero for plastic surgery. <laughs> so we arranged for a truck to go to pick them up and it turned out our loading dock was closed on Saturday and Sunday. So we couldn't bring them in until Monday. That would happen around 11 to 12. The governor went on TV around noon at Friday and he said that the, the state was going to pro seize all the ventilators in the state within 24 hours. And like panicked, I was like, oh my God, we gotta get these in here before the governor gets them. And we weren't gonna be able to get them in by, by, by until Monday. So we had ca called these guys, turned out it went to our legal department because the, the plastic surgeons wanted confirmation that they get them back either brand new or in good condition. I was having trouble with our legal group and I wanted to phone lawyers and this in the middle of all this. Well, by Sunday, Dan Baker, our CMO, I caught Dan the phone, and today, I will never forget what he said to me. And what he said was that every human being need, that needs a ventilator should get a ventilator, and that it's not just Lennox we're dealing with here. And it, to me, it was the first, I, I changed that day. It was like, you know, we're all so darn worried about ourselves and, and our own pay, you know, now what's, what, what's very interesting also is I've talked to our department. We've had, we have made meetings pretty much every day. You know, it, there was a kumbaya moment, obviously, and we're right, you know, now we're really dealing with a competitive environment again, you know, with getting our, ele our elective cases going or who's going to go first. And it's this bizarre, but I just don't have it in me like I used to like that. I'm, I'm, I'm much better. I feel like I kind of, it's almost like I have found out this public health piece of me that I didn't know I had. And I think that there was a really important thing that we have to be, we have to take care of one another. And we have to be aware of the, of the, the social determinants. We can't, I think, you know, our relationship with you has grown over the years because that's how we behave. You know, we had to get a week, we've been known each other for almost three years now. We've, we've gotten to know each other very well as human beings, but you know, you know how neurosurgeons are. And um, in the end, I think that to me, your hospital, Early on was a manifestation of how to do the right thing well and how to support people in, in need and, and, and do it irrespective of income and money. And we did it. But this moment was really the time when it became apparent. And we all have to start thinking this way, you know, in some, in some ways as a, as a doctor, as a department, as a hospital, as a system. 
but there's a money element. And um, I think that's why these next three to six months are so critical because the rubber's gonna hit the road. Is it gonna become political? Or is money gonna be doled out to Republicans and Democrats or Americans? Are we gonna, are we, are we gonna, or how, I talked to Roth this morning. I live in New York City. I'm a freaking New Yorker. I never thought I would be, but I am. Like, what, what's my posture? I've got to decide for myself how committed I am to this city, to this hospital. You can't, you can't veer from it because it's going to be really tough. And I think you probably are thinking the same thing. You, you, this has probably made you more committed to your, to your hospital and to your population you serve. Right. So I imagine that's what this does, did that to you too. Yes. So um, we have some comments here from, uh, there's a panelist, Dr. Randy D'Amico. He <laughs> asked a question, who is the extremely handsome neurosurgeon who has brought Wyckoff to the forefront of Brooklyn neurosurgical care? <laughs> 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 so, and, but then he had a follow-up. He said, but, but seriously, thoughts on having major tertiary care centers have relationships with community hospitals for backup. And he explains an example that uh, Gustavo, I mentioned to you this weekend uh, of a woman with a subarachnoid hemorrhage who, who had a ventriculostomy placed at, uh, in Wyckoff uh, by Dr. D'Amico. And then um, there were a lot of hurdles uh, to transfer her uh, to a tertiary center well, for advanced uh, neurosurgical care with neurocritical care, neuroendovascular capabilities. Uh, she ended up coming to Lennox and we treated her and she did fine. She recovered, she went home and she's normal right now. So how, uh, what's your view on these relationships uh, between Wyckoff and let's specifically Lennox, but also uh, not just neurosurgery, but in, in, in anything that has to do with uh, more advanced care for patients. I, I, one of the best things that has happened to the community of patients served by Wyckoff has been the, our ability to get patients who need quaternary care and sometimes tertiary care to uh, Lenox Hill in a very rapid fashion and with very good communication. And that happens right now in a couple of areas and neurosurgery is one of the areas. And as David mentioned before, that has been going on now. Well, I didn't know it was three years, David, but uh, so three years. Um, we've, we've grown together. We've learned uh, how to work together. And um, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to, to David in particular for not letting go of us because he could have easily said, can't deal with these people. Um, we have limitations of all sorts and a main one being a financial limitation and uh, there there are many out there who would have given up on us and there are many who do give up on us um, but your department and there are others right cardiology is also with us um, that have learned to work with us to serve our patients and um, I'm very grateful for that and I I, my degree of comfort in my position is to some extent uh, void by the fact that I know that if, uh, if the, a, a person who needs neurosurgery right now shows up in our emergency department, Randy the Amico, the, what is it, the, the extremely handsome neurosurgeon <laughs> uh, is going to be on the phone. And if he's not on the phone, uh, one of his colleagues, one of your colleagues will will be there and in three years how many times have we had to say whoa that was really wrong that shouldn't have happened i maybe one time maybe not even really so it, it's really an example of how a uh, urban safety net hospital can get top-notch support uh, from a uh, leading edge neurosurgical group 
Um, and I don't think you guys are any worse off for helping us. And you only can say that, you can only say that, but uh, if you have been really bad for you guys, we wouldn't have been together anymore. So I'm very proud of this relationship and it, it's an example. We've done it with several subspecialty services for Northwell Health and Lenox Hill in particular. Not all of, all of them have been as successful and not even every neurosurgeon has been as successful here as Dr. D'Amico is, but, but it can happen. And, and David has been the, uh, the, the, the steady force that has um, allowed it to evolve into what it is today. So thank you. And as, as a continuation to this, uh, any thoughts of, of developing uh, the neurovascular services further at Wyckoff Hospital? I would love to. I really would love to. Um, but um, I think David said a couple of things that are very real. Our financial challenges are now bigger than ever because after the COVID crisis, our hospital is empty and we can't even do a tonsillectomy. We can't do an appendectomy unless it's an emergent case. Right now, our surgeons are all with their hands tied. Our uh, proceduralists are all waiting and our ER is seeing a quarter of the patients that they were seeing before. And our inpatient wards are as empty as I've ever seen them. So financially, this is potentially catastrophic uh, and unfair because just a few weeks ago, we, had, we were carrying a substantial portion of the COVID patients in New York City. Uh, despite the fact that we're not a very large hospital, at one point we had about 290, 290, 290 COVID patients here when our capacity is about 200 beds. So um, from being, you know, uh, you could call it, I don't, that word is being overutilized, but you could call us, you know, heroes, uh, stalwarts, uh, uh, soldiers, warriors, and now, there's no patient and there, there's no money and wh who's gonna bail us out? So in that, in that environment, it's really hard to think about neurovascular and trauma centers and things that we really should be because we are isolated here to a large extent. Yeah, I think there's- One day, one day we will. I think there's gonna be uh, a reckoning. Um, and I, I this is I mean, whether it's Wyckoff, all the, 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 the these hospitals that have always been on the edge. These the Brooklyn hospitals, and for that matter, you know the the the, the uh, balance of, of, of resources. I mean, everybody needs a bailout. I mean, the restaurant business, the airlines. I mean, there, everyone has this incredible you know loss, and uh, unfortunately, it's a, it's as much uh, political, ethical, financial power. And uh, what we ha what we need to do is. Uh, all we can do is be human beings and do everything we can as neurosurgeons to uh, serve the population, which has always been our focus. Um, in fact, I, when I, I went to Javits after, uh, for a couple of weeks, and the first woman I took care of came from Wyckoff. There's some George <laughs> true story. And what's so amazing was about this experience was it, knowing it came from Wyckoff was, was very, it was for me, it was, like my first page, my first, my own page, I felt like a, like a fellow or something. It was my, yeah. it's the, my patient, you know, when you go on the ward, it's your first patient. And um, she was intubated and she just, I think the ER was so full that they intubated her and sent, they, she was admitted for a couple of days, but they got her out of there. And uh, you know, they, the truth is the army guys didn't really know how to treat COVID yet. Cause they had just started. They were still giving antibiotics and they were giving fluids and they weren't, we learned a lot at Lennox very quickly. Uh, it was a brand new disease. When, when she extubated on her, her second day, and it was honestly, I got to tell you, it was probably the most, of all the crazy stuff we do in neurosurgery, all the incredible operations and bypasses and aneurysms. And I, it, to this day, it may remain my, my most memorable medical experience. Really? Oh, yeah. And I'll tell you something else. That's why we're here for you. Because that's what the essence of being a physician is. We were trained for this. We, we've, been, we've gone through the training. We've, we've been through 
hard work, medical school, residency, sleepless nights, bananas in the shower for dinner. You know, we, <laughs> we, 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 were, we are prepared to do this and we like to work hard. And we, we, ha we have the capability to do everything we can to help bail you guys out. I mean, we will. And now look, it's not gonna bring you patience, but you should never ever worry about uh, someone not being taken care of in, in need. And that's something that, that, that that's going to run even more through the veins of our, our department going forward. We have, we are the luckiest guys in the world where we are, and, and we're going to deal with our, I talked to Roth this morning, we're going to deal with our own challenges in Manhattan that are unique to us. But, you know, our, our commitment to, my commitment to the, this, 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 the, the population and people in need are, is greater than ever. And um, look, we, not every Lennox patient is uh, from Fifth Avenue either, by the way, but uh, we, we have, that's our ethic. And, what we need to do is demonstrate leadership. And uh, if it means us coming over there and talking to your doctors, doing a, a Zoom seminar for the Wyckoff community, uh, coming back, you know, we have a great marketing organization to help you. If, you, if our, our department does it all on, on our own, we have a, a freaking Netflix show coming out in, in three weeks. Uh, know, cool. so, so long story short, you know, you can rely on us to, uh, to do everything we can to help. But I, I you know, there may, it's, it may be in, unsolvable problem. I, I, it's, 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 a, it's a catastrophe. And um, money's money. So uh, we're, we're very hopeful that we can uh, continue to serve and find a way through this with you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know our leadership is committed to it. Michael has uh, obviously um, been a, a superstar during this, this uh, event. And, uh, uh, and so managing the resources of the whole state have been critical. You know, and the, 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 the Brooklyn, you need to have hospitals there. You can't, these hospitals are camp, and they were, they, like I said, they, it's even more of a reason to have them now going forward because we're going to undoubtedly have another spike. Yes. And if these hospitals go away, you're going to have a bigger problem for everybody else. So it's, it's self-serving to, to support these hospitals. But I don't, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is, and that's, somebody has to be less smarter than me. So. Mm -hmm. Gustavo, on another topic uh, that goes down your alley of, uh, of clinical pediatrics, uh, what's your thought on these uh, 100 plus cases of Kawasaki-like syndrome in, in New York City in children with COVID-19? Well, it certainly seems to be real. Um, if we have not seen a single case here. We are uh, aware of it. We actually have to report to New York State on a daily basis if we saw any cases that were even suspicious. And we're ready to test any child that has any concerning sign or symptom right away for COVID. Um, it's evolving, just like COVID itself is, is an evolving learning process. Um, and um, it's fascinating that this virus that goes through the lungs can also cause this like disseminated vasculopathy uh, and uh, a, a coagulopathy, right? And, and other things that you probably know better than I do. It's so we, we are aware. I talked to, uh, we were very early on to learn about as much as we could. I luck, was lucky enough to have a relationship with China. And we had a couple of Zoom seminars just like this with uh, a Wuhan team and then a Hong Kong team. In fact, we're the Hong Kong group that found this combination of rem, uh, remdes of, 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 of Rimavarin, Kalitra, and beta interferon is going to be with us next week on Monday. I'll invite you. Okay, great. Ivan, Ivan Ho. He, he, he wrote the article in JAMA about right. this, this combination therapy that seemed to be very, very beneficial and relatively, they, were, they weren't really sick. They were sort of stable, sick COVID patients. Right. And, and there's a Lancet article too. Yeah. Remarkable improvement, but they were they weren't like intubated. So you know, but still, it was, and it wasn't randomized. It actually was randomized. But long story short, I think that um, I asked him if he he didn't see it there. He's not a. They didn't see it in Hong Kong. They didn't have a ton of patients, and in fact, Kawasaki's is an Asian disease. Yeah. It, it affects Asian people, and and in fact, the the um, uh, the distribution in the United States is iris there's no Asian predominance. No. The other thing about Kawasaki's in general is it affects children under five. This is, is it looks like it's peaking between five to 15 or so. So it's not Kawasaki's disease. It's, it's a, it's phenotype is Kawasaki's disease. Right. 
but it's probably some, you know, viral immunological, it's an, it's an autoimmune phenomenon or some immunological reaction. It's really with Kawasaki, we, still don't, we know what the at reaction is, we don't know what the virus is in Kawasaki's disease probably. We just don't know what the, vi what the, what the infection actually is or what causes it. But it's, it's, it's for parents and grandparents with, with kids, you know, we've been going around, oh, yeah. I can't get it, you know? And uh, I, I did a, a, a talk for my daughter's high school uh, yesterday, uh, an, an assembly uh, about kind of the experience of, of this a doctor and kind of what we're doing with you today. And uh, that's the parents want to know, you know, that's, this is the latest, greatest thing, but it's a new disease. I, I, and uh, luckily with uh, very few of them, if they're treated, are doing poorly. The ones that have died have had pre-existing illness or are they're developmentally delayed or they had pre-existing pulmonary problems, kind of comorbidities like adults. So it's not like, you know, young, healthy kids are dying of COVID, not at least not yet. It's very, still very rare. But, uh, you know, I think the governor had a great uh, uh, press conference today going over some of this stuff. And I agree with you. I think he's been remarkably calm, uh, stayed, and, and uh, has had the right message throughout. And um, it's, uh, it's, he's been a, a rock, and it, it allows us to, you know, be confident that the right decisions will be made, hopefully. Um, we're, we're, you know, a lot, there's a lot ahead of us, though. Talking about the group from Hong Kong, uh, Gustavo, we're going to have on June 5th uh, a global virtual uh, symposium on COVID. We're going to have speakers from uh, uh, Wuhan, from Hong Kong, Germany, and New York City. Wow. It would be great to, to, to promote this uh, throughout uh, Wyckoff uh, so that uh, we 100%. have a, a good uh, representation. Yeah. We even got Mike Dowling to come. He's going to talk at the end. Yes, awesome. we, got, we got Jimmy Roberts to interview him. So Jimmy's a golf announcer, has nothing to do because there's no golf yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I figured you might as well interview Michael. <laughs> and John's gonna talk about clinical trials and uh, uh, we have a, somebody from, from Goldman talk about the financial implications of the, uh, a friend of Rafa's. So uh, we'd love to have you there. Maybe, you know, there'll be a question answer. And if you're, you know, maybe you could speak up and speak to some of your experience. I think that would be invaluable for the, hope for the audience. So. Thank you. How's, her, how's your wife doing? She's good. She's good. Um, uh, she's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, our, and then I, you. I understand you're stable with all your medical stuff, hopefully with us, right? I'm not going to talk. We'll talk offline about that. No, we don't want to violate PHI. But I, he, I asked him, he's not running you. you. You should be working out as much as possible. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, I don't I don't have any more questions here from the chat. <laughs> so if you guys want to ask uh, anything else, Gustavo, any final thoughts? I agree. Really thank you for this opportunity. This is a unique experience for me. Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> we'll do more like this. Once in a lifetime. <laughs> how, did you, how, did your, how did your brother react? Um, he, he was flying to, to, to New York just as we saw the first case of virus at Wyckoff. You know, we had the first death in New York, right? The first patient who was reported dead in New York from COVID was from Wyckoff. What, date, you... what date was that? Like February, was it February? March 14. March 14. The first death reported in New York State with ours. It turns out that there had been a death two days before in, I believe, Long Island, um, but it had not been reported. And in New York City, it was the first death by f overall, by far. But a few days before he had been, he was getting on a flight to New York for a meeting. And we started talking about this and uh, he had not really been uh, uh, keeping up with the media on it. So he was, it was very sobering for him to hear what I had to say. And I asked him, Are you, do you really need to get on that plane? He said yes, and he, he came over and uh, somehow he flew back and forth between New York and LA within three or four days and escaped unharmed. Just what's, a couple happening, what's happening in the Hollywood community? Is there, I mean, he must have insight into, has anybody, there, I mean, other than Rita Wilson and uh, Tom Hanks, we haven't heard of, bunch of film people really getting sick or obviously well quarantined and protected, but how are they, how do you think they're going to react? What's, what's the word with the, 
the film business and, and what's, what, how are they reacting to this? You know, we don't really talk about that. Uh, it, it, he's been sheltering in place uh, all this time. Um, every, all his projects were frozen. The, the Cannes Film Festival that he was going to uh, uh, is not going to happen. It doesn't look like it's going to happen at all. Uh, a movie that he had coming out uh, in, in July is now coming out in the fall. So there's been a series of delays, a project that was about to start. It's, 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 everything is frozen. It's, it's like frozen in time. Uh, that's, that's what I can tell you. You know, my 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 ex my ex wife's brother my ex brother in law runs a twenty four which is a yeah yeah it's a big company yeah so he, he called me two two memorable events that are sort of somewhat related number one and one of my friends is on this phone call I remember going out we went out for sushi about like the first week of March and we it, it was I, I remember my brain just not it was like not even a, a, in my wildest imaginations I couldn't have ever considered. I look back at that moment in time of the, the, the kind of the, the frivolity of it and the, the sake and, the, and just that moment of how we're so far from that. You know, it's just like what, what that life was like. It just wow. you know, it evaporated just so quickly, right? Yes. And, and right around that same time, my brother-in-law calls me, my ex-brother-in-law. He's A24. He goes, Dave, we, we started to get an idea that this was a big deal. You know, it took even, we, know, we didn't, you know, it was, we, we, we couldn't believe it until you saw it. It's like the White Walkers in, in Grand Game of Thrones. It was, <laughs> Everybody's telling you, everybody tells you they're there, but until you see one, you're like, they're not really there. Come on, you're kidding me. But the, um, the amazing thing was that he said to me, he said, what do you think's gonna happen with the, cause he has see a lot of projects and movies. What do you think's gonna happen to the theaters? It's like early, th first week of March. I said, honestly, Dave, I don't think they're gonna be open. I mean, I, I, and I don't see how they could, and that was even with my kind of limited understanding of what was happening, that was when I started to change. Like you went through this kind of like, so then it became like, oh, we all of a sudden were sitting everybody home and stopping elective surgery. And it was like this wave accelerated and I, it did require, and I think that's what you experienced. And plus you got sick. I mean, going through this, it took a, it was kind of like the, the whatever, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of death. It's like, you finally just accepted this is what's happening or something. Right, right. I, 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 it was so fast, and, but it's so memorable. And I just don't, I don't want it to go away. I think it's, it's something that we'll carry with us. And I want my, you know, it's something that's very, was a valuable experience and was one that I think will, will taught us how to be human, not human again, but maybe more human. And I, 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 I can't, I appreciate your candor, your friendship. And I, and I heard you were, when I heard you were sick, I just like, of all people, you know, <laughs> Thank you're, you. the guy, you're the one guy that shouldn't have gotten it, but uh, we're so happy to see you're in good health and, uh, we have a lot to look. We have a lot to look forward to together, and we're we're going to make each other proud and, and do everything we can to, uh, you know, keep doing what we're doing and, and do good do good work together. So thank you, David. Thank you, Gustavo. Thank you, Rafael. For the time for joining us. Thank nice you. Nice to meet you, Jafel, and nice to meet you, Flora. Nice to meet you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Yeah. Bye.